Welcome everyone. I am Jill Jonathan and I'm with Red Wine and Blue. At Red Wine and Blue, we are a community of women who use digital media and friend to friend organizing to change the world one suburb at a time. And we're working really hard at it. And so today is International Women's Day. So I will be joined with some fabulous women to talk about what that means to us and also to talk about how our rights really aren't guaranteed. So we're going to talk about women's right, rights and the fact that it's International Women's Day. So um, I will start having some other wonderful women join me. It looks like Joe has joined. Hi, Joe. Welcome. Hi. Hi. How are you? Ray. Hi, Ray. Hi. Good afternoon. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you. <laughs> So Ray is with Red Wine and Blue, um, and then it looks like we have Heather Gardner. Welcome, Heather. Hi, Heather. Here I am. Hi. Yay, you're here. So welcome. I'm here. Happy <laughs> National Women's Day, everyone. Let's yes. Go. Let's go. And then it looks like Jess Piper just joined us as well. So welcome, Jess. Hello. Hi, Jess. Oh my so gosh. good to be here with you guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is an inspiring group. <laughs> I know. I'm like, how exciting that all these wonderful women have joined. Um, so I think we're waiting a few for a few more women that will join, but we can go ahead and get started. So, um, Joe, I mean, come on now. It's International uh, Women's Day, and it. I think we have less rights than we did a year ago. So yeah. let's start there. Yeah, I mean, at least we get this one day, right? Like we comprise like more than 50% of the population, but hey, we got a day. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's this this International Women's Day hits a little different than last year because um, not only are we nearing the year anniversary of uh, the Dobbs decision, which stripped us of a fundamental human right we, I wouldn't say enjoyed, but had for 50 years, um, we're, we're looking at a litany of restrictive legislation, bills, measures, everything from what we can and cannot wear um, on the floors of some state houses to um, what ages our children can work. Um, so it's, I mean, I'm really interested because in this conversation, because we have such a wide swath of women participating who have experienced life. Uh, and Jane of the North is, is actually from Canada and in Canada. So she does represent our international component, but um, we just such a wide variety of stories that everyone feels a little bit differently, experiences life differently. These rights are um, impacting all of us across the board and differently. So I'm really excited and eager to have this conversation and hear what everybody has to say. For myself, I've said it before, the number one thing I think about, honestly, is that I cannot believe I live in a world where my soon to be 10 year old daughter has you know, fewer rights uh, facing her than I did at her age and how in the world that's possible in the year 2023. Um, it's just mind blowing. So that those are my thoughts and I'm so excited for this conversation and thank everybody. Rachel's here now. Thank you all for joining. I'm so excited to get this underway. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. I see Rachel Benman joined and Jane. Um, I see that you're here. I'm trying to invite you to speak. So hopefully that will work soon. Um, and yeah, just jump in, ladies. Like, really, if anybody wants to go next, um, or I can call on somebody, um, I'm happy to do that. Ray, I'm going to call on you since you're from Red, White, and Blue. So just wanting to know your thoughts on this International Women's Day. Um, well, thanks for having me. And I wholeheartedly agree with JoJo. Um, I have a two and a half year old daughter, and I definitely had more rights at two and a half back in the 80s than she does even in 2023. And so um, while we only have one day, um, I do think it's sp especially significant because um, it's international. So we get to talk about not only women's issues here in the United States, but issues that women are um, dealing with every day. And so um, we have very few international days. So I really appreciate um, being able to lift up the experiences of women um, across the globe. And so um, I'm particularly um, excited about some of the research that the United Nations um, has done around International Women's Day and all the resources um, they have on their website. So I would encourage folks to further educate yourself by um, joining the UN's um, website to just 
learn more about International Women's Days and many of the initiatives they're spearheading. Yeah, thank you, Ray. And I just want to point out, you know, we're dealing with a lot of stuff here in the United States, but um, as we know, there's women in other countries that are experiencing losing their rights as well. Um, so Rachel, I'll just call on you. I'll call on everybody once and then honestly, feel free to jump in. Um, but Rachel, I know you're pretty up to date with some international things. So just would love to hear your thoughts. Well, I, I love what Ray said. I mean, you know, this is it's important not to to be as us in the United States to be the United States of navel gazers because what affects us, what we're going through is you know we're part of an interconnected world as much as that is really apparently very difficult for a lot of people to accept. And we don't need to build walls around our country or our towns. We need to work together. There's power in that and using our voices together. So when we stand up for our rights here, when they are taken away, other people are heartened by that. They, it's, it's a remembrance of what democracy is. I was in the UK this summer and I remember it was after Kansas voted um, on abortion rights. And that was a really hard fought victory for the women of Kansas who the people of Kansas, really. And, um, you know, it, they're trying other ways to to try to uh, squirrel their way in and take away their right to reproductive health. But I was in London and, and I remember talking to someone from Australia who heard the news. And, you know, aside from the fact they were appalled that this is even an issue, um, you know, they were excited that we were able to overcome it with democracy. And that's what so many women in so many places fight for is the right to make their, the laws that control their destiny. And that's what's so powerful about democracy. So when we exercise it in the United States, when we fight back, that is a beacon of hope to so many. Likewise, when you see women in Iran, um, you know, they're, what they stand to lose is so much greater than I could ever imagine losing, even after everything that my family has been through, it doesn't hold a candle to what they are experiencing and what they are fighting for. So I think we can look at that and say, okay, if they can do that, then I can certainly go talk to my neighbor and have an uncomfortable conversation, but tell her the truth about what Fox News is, what they did. And even if she doesn't want to hear it, at least I know that I've said it and that seed has been planted. And she might go looking for more information. Yeah, I love that. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and Heather, I'd love to know your thoughts as well. Yeah, I mean, today is, it's a bittersweet day, of course, because we always love the celebration. Any excuse for chocolate and flowers, am I right? <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I'm thinking about everything that you guys have echoed here. The fact that women have less rights on this day than we did last year. Um, also, something that's weighing really heavy on my heart right now are uh, is the trans community and you know people who want to be women and the rights that are being stripped from there. Because let's let's just not like sugarcoat this here. It's not just an attack on us. It's an attack on a lot of people in this country and all over the world. And you know, my heart is heavy for for those women as well who are just trying to live their lives like we're just trying to live our lives. And yeah, I mean, Rachel, everything you said is completely correct. You know, we need to hold people like Fox News accountable. We need to have these uncomfortable conversations because the world in which we're heading towards is is not the world that I want to live in. And we can do something about it. A hundred percent. So right, Heather. I I think, you know, whenever we see someone and we see the rights of other communities in our country being taken away, we need to know that's just a warm up. When people have a victory, when they get what they want in one area, they will come after us. I don't know if you know, uh, there was a Fox News personality. I don't know which one it was. I find them indistinguishable, so I don't learn their names. But uh, one of them, <laughs> um, you know, post said Happy International Women's Day and posted a picture of Pete Buttigieg and Chastin and their babies. And, you know, the point is to belittle and other people 
And in full disclosure, I actually posted a picture of Josh Hawley kissing his wife, which was probably not super nice of me, but it is what it is. It's how I feel. Like, um, you know, everyone can... I, I want to point out the hypocrisy, but my, but you know, the thing is to other people to allow that to be normalized, a family, two husbands raising the babies they adopted is egregious. And the entire point of it is to other a segment and to try to belittle and demean them. And in doing so, if we don't stand up for that every single time, we will be next. And we, it's not hyperbolic to say that anymore. We've seen too many instances to know this is 100% their game plan and what they want. And it's also just piggybacking off of that, Rachel. Like, it's also just, like, the dumbest sexist joke ever. Because, again, like, it's 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 a twofold thing with the Pete Buttigieg thing. It's obviously, you know, mocking their, their lifestyle, their relationship, which is nothing but beautiful and nothing but wonderful. But at the same time, it's taking, you know, two men and saying, oh, look at you, you're a woman. Like, that is, on the international, like, that is the most lame joke ever it is. Oh, it's by the so way, tired yes. and so lame and not smart and dumb yeah. but again it creates this entire like ecosystem where women again are second class to men and right. that's that's yeah. the point that they're trying to make here. absolutely and, mm-hmm. and so yeah it's it's insulting it's ridiculous and it's something that needs to be called out mm-hmm. yes absolutely and heather i like you said like it's making us like second class citizens. Like, I, ugh, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. And Jess Piper, I would love to hear from you. I know you have a wealth of knowledge about the education system and what's happening there and being a former teacher. Um, so if you can just shed some light from that lens, we'd love to hear from it. From well, you. Sure. I'm so happy to be here. Happy International Women's Day. I actually ran for the Missouri House um, in District 1, and um, I didn't win. And that goes along with all of our history, because in my district, we have never, ever, ever elected a woman uh, and not a Democrat in 30 years. But I hail from the state where our first uh, day of legislation was aimed at making sure that Missouri women legislators covered up their Mm -hmm. arms. And I'm glad that you guys are pointing to what's going on in the trans community as well, because a lot of my um, my GOP Missouri state lawmakers are absolute trolls. So they are spending the day, you know, tweeting out, you know, happy International Women's Day and, and talking about how they can define what a woman is. And here's the funny thing. They always say the left can't define a woman. You ask them to define a woman and guess what we are? We are ovaries. We are a womb and we are a vagina. Mm. They literally say that we are the sum of our parts. And that's what we're dealing with here. Missouri has almost a near complete abortion ban. Um, They haven't backed off that at all. My daughters are in the same boat. They have fewer rights than I have. They're attacking our schools. They're attacking our hospitals. They're attacking our rural communities. And all of this has everything to do with women. It's uh, keeping us in our place, keeping us quiet, keeping us down, keeping that, you know, boot on top of us and keeping us uh, where they want us. And that is out of the workplace and that is you know barefoot and pregnant and it seems like that tinfoil hat thing to say that but it's not because they prove it with all of the legislation that they push through Uh, women are in a dark place in Missouri and in lots of other red states and it's nice to have these communities so that other people can say you know we see you we're still fighting for you um, even though some of you are in places where you're a lot safer though I will say when extremists are elected in Missouri, they don't just stop at state legislators. They keep moving up. They move to Congress. They move to somebody uh, was just talking about Josh Hawley. He's from Missouri. We didn't stop him here. So now he is impacting every single one of you. So what happens in red extremist states bleeds out into the entire country. Mm. Amen. <laughs> so true. I know. I'm like, you. The, just, I always appreciate how you just lay it out there you just say it what say what it is um and i want to ask jane so we have jane who's from canada so um i'm just really curious jane your thoughts of you know watching from canada and you know let us know what's going on there as well well thank you for asking me to speak I, i'm sitting here like i'm in some master class of incredible women <laughs> listening to everything you guys all have to say and uh 
you know, what really speaks to me is when you say that what happens in red states bleeds into the rest of the country. And, and what I've had thrown at me from day one is mind your own business, you commie, leftist, socialist, Canadian person. And um, the problem is everything that happens in America affects Canada probably more than anybody else. So, you know, we are our official opposition leader right now has basically got Nazis in his party. Like it's we are facing the same things you are, but in a smaller country, like smaller population. The country's bigger, but there's less people. And, you know, we we Canada's had a um, there's no criminal action that can be taken against abortion. That's been in our laws since 1988. So you can have an abortion basically till the day before your baby's born and there can be no action taken against either you or your health care provider. Overwhelmingly across the country, abortions are permitted without any uh, question up to 23 weeks and six days. And after that, it's really rare for a woman to seek an abortion. The difficulty is the same here as it is there. Poor women have the right, but they can't necessarily access it. They have Indigenous women have the right, but they can't provide her. Um, you know, and so people in urban centers are far more likely to get fair health care than somebody in the r- in the rural areas. Yeah, it's interesting it, wow. because it it does it transcends borders. <laughs> um, you know, these are mm-hmm. issues that I- impact women all over the all over the globe. Yeah, yeah and a- I think. Oh, I was just going to say, Jane, it's so interesting, like living in the U.S., I think some of us joke like, oh, I think I'm going to move to Canada. (laughs) Well, you know, I have like two acres and you can all build little hurts in my in my (laughs) way. (laughs) But I have to warn you, like marijuana is legal, but the taxes are high and alcohol is so expensive here. (laughs) I'm sorry. No deal. (laughs) <laughs> That's funny. I, don't know. I was like, we have a plan B. I guess we have to. Um, but you know, and- I'll tell you, British Columbia was the first province to um, decriminalize abortion. And they, this year, just in, I think, in February, announced legislation to provide free birth control and free morning after pills to all women in that province. So that was just, I cried mm. when I saw that. It was like, you know, how incredible to just recognize that these are human mm-hmm. rights. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we have one more woman that has just joined us, Ty. So I just want to say welcome and would just love to hear your thoughts um, on this International Women's Day. Hello, ladies. I'm so glad to be a part of this um, with you guys on such this momentous occasion, even though we're in the midst of madness <laughs> right now, uh, it seems. But um, just listening to the comments, you know, it reminds me of just how incredibly strong we are. None of, we're not whining, we're not crying, we're fighting. Mm-hmm. And definitely for someone like myself, who's a mother, that's who I'm fighting for. Not for myself. I've, I've got more years behind me than I do in front of me at this point, more than likely. But I do worry about my 22-year-old. I worry about my 19-year-old who's in college. She's got you know, with triple target on her back as a black woman and a member of the LGBTQ community. So that concerns me as the attacks on women's autonomy, freedoms, as well as the LGBTQ community, it gives me, you know, double anxiety and just wondering how safe this world is going to be for her. Um, You know, legislatures change. I don't know if we're going to see things turn themselves around during our generation, but I hope that we're able to plant the seeds in the one coming behind us so they will carry the torch and make the change they need and want to see. And I think that we should start looking outside of America. We have been so arrogant and that has kept us so far behind. I look at other developed nations that have had women leaders of their country and we still we barely they couldn't take a black man Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know so and what you know we should be celebrating the first woman vice president period everyone should be excited about that that's progress that's amazing but instead it's, it's not and you know when i look at the laws that we're passing um like mexico i live here on the border and i've thought about moving they voted unanimously the Supreme Court to decriminalize abortion this year. 
Mm-hmm. They released women that had been previously arrested for having an abortion. They have the first openly lesbian cabinet member in the Morena party serving under Manuel Lopez Obrador right now. And she was elected a center prior to the cabinet. They also have four, I believe, openly transgender women serving in the Congress who were elected. Their laws for their Congress, they have to set aside a certain percentage of each underrepresented group who will uh, elect someone from that group and send to represent them so that everyone has a voice, whether it's one person or 10 people from, from that particular group. But there is someone there to speak for you. Argentina decriminalized abortion. Cuba, abortion's free and on demand. Cuba, the place they want to criticize all the time is not being free. Has the women have more rights as far as body wise, freedom of speech is a different thing, though than than we do. They're not they don't have to be concerned about dying in labor as much or if they're having a miscarriage or if it's just not the right time for them. And I think sharing the stories and when people see how the world is moving past us, that it will push them out of this bubble that they're in and realize that we can all learn from each other and that's how we're going to progress. That's how we're going to make it better for the next generation of women, you know, coming behind us. Amazing insights. I'm so curious to to know just if anybody wants to weigh in, you know, what your personal feeling is on why it seems like there's this uptick, concerted effort in rolling back rights, attacks on our fundamental reproductive rights and bodily autonomy, but also on the trans community, you know, on LBGTQ people, why you think this is happening right now? We're in- increasingly. Anybody weigh in, please. I got some thoughts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would know, love to hear them. <laughs> thank you. And here's, and here's the thing. I think about this a lot because I grew up in the South. Um, and I grew up in an evangelical um, household. I went to church every Sunday. I grew up in a very, very white, you know, middle class neighborhood, which is, you know, it's a declining thing here in America. You know, for the first time in the last decade, Um, the white population in America has declined. Uh, And that's a really scary thing for someone who's had power literally the entire time this country has been in existence. Mm -hmm. And I hear it and I see it from people that I grew up with, from people that I love, um, my friends and family. And so it's not an abstract thing to me why, why they're so afraid. And that it really is, I think, the thing, fear, you know. And for the people at home who are just people watching Fox News and are getting, you know, swept into this, it's one thing. But for the people who have held this power, and again, like we can look at pictures of Congress. We can look at pictures all across this country in every single state, and you can see who has the majority of the power here. And for the first time, that's not representing the entire make of this country, and that is terrifying to them. So I think that they're trying to consolidate their power in any way possible. Um, Jojo, we've talked about this before on a separate um, little thing that we did with um, red wine and blue but you know it, it really is as simple as trying to consolidate power if you want an abortion if you want um trans rights if you want these things you can move to a blue state and we're going to keep this red state let's not forget here that marjorie taylor green has suggested a national divorce let's not forget here that florida has suggested eliminating the democratic party from an entire state i think it's very obvious why this is happening and i'll get off my soapbox now and let someone else talk <laughs> that was awesome not a soapbox at all anybody Else but you're, you're completely but you're completely right i mean i think that's the heart of it though i mean it's uh i mean they see power and influence in this country as a zero-sum game there are a lot of people who see it that way and if people with black and brown skin have more power then they have less um and you know i know there's sometimes jokes made about this but uh about whether or not it's about economic insecurity, but I think it, it really is this, you know, I guess white America really did enjoy the whole like, you know, small town, um, just, I don't know, this, this life that, that used to used to exist, but I mean, 
times always change. It's, it's always changing, but it's easy to harken back and, and, and really like use that nostalgia as a ploy. I mean, we all kind of romanticize the past in, in many ways. And I think it's, it's a powerful thing that a lot of politicians uh, like to use it because it's an easy way to control people. It's, um, and it's easier than perhaps dealing with real issues that are, are very difficult to solve. I mean, they're not going to be solved without upsetting a lot of people because they just cannot be solved the way they want them to be. Like, for instance, if we want manufacturing to come back to the United States, we're going to have to come up with some ideas. You know, I mean, we, like that, that's how we get manufacturing here. But politicians, they don't want to tell people that because that's a hard answer. You know, it's easier to say, oh, we're going to bring back air conditioning manufacturing and dishwashers and other things, but that's never coming back to the U.S. So these hard truths um, become very difficult and it's easier to control people with populist ideas. And unfortunately, there's nothing new under the sun. We know that race is is a really big ploy and that trickles down to women because that kind of control and, and you know when we go back to those days of yore with that kind of um that kind of nostalgia uh women had less rights so i think this is part and parcel with that unfortunately and i think and i and you know gay families trans individuals they were never part of the mainstream i mean my grandmother was a teacher and she tells the story of a gay man that she worked with. Um, that he ended up, you know, he, he was forced to leave the school uh, when parents complained. This is a very long time ago in the 50s or 60s. But, uh, you know, this, this is the way a lot of people would like us to be again today. And that means stripping away rights because I don't know why. I think they, they want to feel... Um, you know, more powerful. It's not going to give them anything else in terms of that economic insecurity is not going to just suddenly appear. But um, taking rights away from women um, is, I think, kind of, or other other minor other groups. I think it it may, it kind of scratches that itch to feel powerful in a world where they continue to lose power. Ray, I'd love to know your thoughts um, as a historian and really understanding the history of the United States and I would imagine just um, internationally as well. Um, what are you thinking about where we are today versus where we have been historically? Absolutely. And I just really want to echo what Rachel said. I feel like a lot of this is about control, flat out, flat out control. Um, toxic masculinity wasn't just invented in the 20th or 21st century. It's been going on for um, so long. And um, I even think about back in 1848 when um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott were um, banned from speaking at an anti-slavery convention and they band together and said hey we're going to have our first women's rights convention in new york um, i think back into 1908 when we really started seeing um, folks celebrate international women's day when folks wanted to celebrate um, the work of women garment workers or specifically needle workers um, in New York and to really band together to fight um, against unfair labor practices and flat out just discrimination against women working in those fields. And so um, we stand on the shoulders of the ancestors that have come before us. And so there have been so many amazing women in American history, um, just like um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and even Sojourner Truth, who did her famous Ain't I a Woman speech um, back in the late 1800s. And so um, this, uh, f this is not a new phenomena, um, having uh, making women or anybody who isn't a cisgender man uh being repressed. It's, it's not a mistake at all. And I even think about even next Tuesday, it's equal pay day. It takes so much longer for a woman of any race to make what a man makes doing the same exact jobs. And so these issues are interconnected. And so um, thank you all so much for bringing to light that um, anybody who's outside of the dominant uh, cisgender uh, male uh, 
my majority or minority, depending on who you're talking to, um, has been um, discriminated against. And it takes having hard conversations like this to ensure that folks understand it's not just isolated to one community or one identity, um, but all of us can be discriminated against and attacked. I'm always so grateful for your perspective, Ray. I honestly think of this conversation as this like amazing cake, and then you uh, come in and you're like this perfect icing that just sort of brings it to the next. Oh, uh, thanks, Joe. You, you have so many layers of, of knowledge, and and I wanted to take what you were saying, and I want to go back to Jess. Um, Jess, you're getting called on because uh, Jess has talked a lot about, you know, her background and where she's grown up and she's in Missouri where she said she would have been the first woman ever elected in her district. And I'm just, A, want to applaud her for the bravery of doing that, but also want to ask you a couple of things. How is, what is your experience like as a woman in your part of Missouri and how do we move the needle there? You know, how do we impact change there? Well, I am a white woman, so I would say that my experience is probably much better than, and I'm also, you know, cis, so it's probably much better than it would be if if I were gay or um, were, you know, a person of color. Um, I will say that, you know, I, I was born and raised as a conservative um, Southern Baptist all the way through until I finally left the church in my late 20s, but you know, one of the biggest things when people talk about abortion is they, they think that the right was always against it. They think the church was always against it, the evangelicals, and they weren't. They were not. And everybody needs to go back and, you know, look at your history. Or you could read a couple books. There's one called Democracy in Chains. And there's another one called Jesus and John Wayne or John Wayne and Jesus. I forget which way it goes. But it lines this out for you. This was a movement from the 70s because the Southern Baptist um, Association, the Church Association, broke away from the Baptists because they wanted to keep slavery. So obviously there were some problematic issues there with race and racism. Um, they were really against the Brown v. Board uh, of Education um, and getting rid of, of segregation in schools. So eventually got to the point where they couldn't say they wanted to be racist anymore. They couldn't say it out loud. I mean, they said it in their own spaces, but they couldn't say it out loud. But what they could say is, OK, we're against abortion. They needed a way. Jerry Falwell, 1979, needed a way to organize fundamentalists and evangelicals behind Ronald Reagan against Jimmy Carter, who was a Southern Baptist. So they organized behind um, abortion because before then, even the SBC said, you know, I think they released statements in, in 73, 74, 76, saying we don't love it, but, you know, it's a right and we're going to it's it's what it is. Um, and so abortion didn't become a thing until it had to become a wedge issue to elect Republicans. So we, we would all do so great in reminding people of that. It wasn't about life. They weren't pro-life. It was about winning elections. Um, and that's still what I see today. When I knock doors, I knocked thousands of doors. And the one thing that people would say is, you know, you seem really nice, but I'm a Christian. I can't vote for you because uh, you believe in abortion, um, which knocked me over with the feather. I mean, I was born and raised just like them, but the fact of the matter was abortion. And you have to, you have to give people a little grace too. I will say that because they have been inundated with pro-life propaganda. They literally, quite literally think that you are murdering a baby. So when you knock on the door and you talk about abortion, these folks think that you're murdering a baby. And so it's going to take a whole lot of education and unwinding of the propaganda that we've lived with for a long time. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I think that's incredibly powerful and important that you point that out. And I just, I just kind of curious. Um, for me personally, one of the issues when it comes to rights, I've, Katie Porter tweeted about it this morning. Uh, this, this one impacts me personally: is the lack of affordable childcare um, that it disproportionately impacts and hurts women. For me, my personal story is when I was pregnant with my son in 2009, um, childcare would have cost me more than my pay. And so I had that impossible choice, right? Like, do I stay in the workforce and keep building on my career or do I stay home and raise my son? And so of course, I, I mean, I 
I chose to stay home and raise my son, it was very difficult for us to make ends meet at that time, but it was an impossible choice to make. And it feels like here we are in 2023, it feels like there hasn't been enough progress made on that front. And I think that there's an opportunity for that um, to change. I think we can keep advocating for it. So I'm just curious and we can start with, uh, let's start with Heather. Um, For other people, you know, what is up top of mind? What is, you know, personal to you when it comes to this issue of, of women's rights? Well, you know, just kind of piggybacking off of what you just said there, um, you know, and also what our last speaker just said, too, is, yes, they truly believe that you are killing babies. But how you know that the people who are pushing for this and the Republicans who really just want to consolidate the power that we've been talking about um, is because they are fighting to, you know, basically force birth on people and even children as young as 10 years old in some states. Um, But what they're not doing on the back end is supporting women and all of the things that we need. Like if you truly, truly, truly cared about women and children, like you said you do, then you would make childcare affordable. You would make, um, you know, equal pay in these things. You would, you would make it easier for people to have families, not just force it upon them. So the hypocrisy there is one thing. And that's honestly the top of mind. Um, you know, when I think about these rights too, because I don't have children, uh, my, my spouse and I, my husband and I, we've been married now for eight years and we would love to even have this conversation. Um, but what you're saying right here, um, is, is echoing in our mind too. The fact that like, who's going to stay home? Childcare is so expensive, unaffordable. Grandma lives 3000 miles away. Like how would we even feasibly do this? Um, and a lot of people say just, Oh, just, you know, have the baby and you'll figure it out. But for me, that's not a good plan. I'm very type A. (laughs) I have all my things planned out. Like (laughs) that is not a good enough reason for me to just like, you know, hope that everything is going to work out. I just don't, I just don't feel like that's a great, you know, way to bring a family into this world. Um, And so that is the top of mind for me. And that's why I fight not only for the rights of women to choose what to do with their body at the very end of the day, um, no matter what your feelings are on abortion, I just believe that the government should not be involved in conversations that should be between you and your family and your your doctor. Um, So these are the things that are top of mind of me is also just working towards a more equitable world where we can all get the basic necessities that we need. I mean, we didn't have baby formula this past year. Like, come on. And Republicans voted against, against getting more baby formula to people. These are basic needs that are not being met. And they're forcing families, they're forcing women to give birth without the basic necessities on what raising a family actually needs. And so that's what I'm fighting for. And that's what's top of my mind too, because I'd like to have a family in the near future. And I'm getting old. (laughs) You are not. <laughs> oh, I am. <laughs> Heather, that's so funny. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I just want to go around to the group, you know, individually and just hear from everybody. So Ty, I'll just like choose you next. But you know, what's top of mind for you? What's something personal that you're fighting for right now? Uh, something personal that I'm, I'm fighting for right now is that I just want my girls to be safe. Um, of course, as a mom, you're, you're going to worry. But my 19-year-old, she lives on campus. And last semester, she had a class that was that ended after dark. Because we weren't able to get the paperwork in time, she had to settle for a dorm that was an upperclassman housing, which is like a 30-minute walk. And literally, I'm like, you have to call me. And I just, you don't want to go to that dark place. But she's so tiny. She probably weighs 80 pounds soaking wet. And I just thinking what if the worst thing imaginable happened to her and then what if she got pregnant and that's it was really disheartening and and I I I thought about that and that weighs on me I worry on about them when they're not here I worry about my girls because there's been an increase in just violence against women I was reading something that said one in four girls and that's all girls are struggling with mental health issues. So that's a big thing for me because right now these kids aren't dumb. They see what's going on and they're they're losing hope a lot of them. And I worry about that for my children. I, I worry if they are going to be mentally strong enough. Um, we live, thankfully, I live right over the Texas border in New Mexico. And in New Mex in Texas, I didn't qualify for Medicaid, but I do here. Uh, Because up to almost $50,000 a year, you and your family can have Blue Cross Blue Shield. I was blown away, you know? 
Um, but I think about if I get sick or I have to be prolonged or, or in some situation where um, I'm incapacitated for any reason or for a while. And it scares me. I'm scared to go to the doctor. I'm scared that they won't take care of me. I'm afraid that if I go to the hospital for any reason that I may not come home and my kids will be orphaned. That's something that I never in my life, and I have four live children, thought that I would have to think about. And it's something that I think about every day because I am getting older. You know, I've had COVID. I don't know 10 years from now how the effect that that is going to have on my body where something simple like a pneumonia could turn into something worse. So I'm... We need to take better care of our women. We need better resources. And like Heather said and Rachel said, um, and Joe talking about the daycare situation, they have free daycare here in New Mexico now. And it's not the, the income. It's pretty high. It's pretty inclusive. It includes a large. And they have seen an increase in the productivity of the women not having to worry about that. They're not calling in. Like they've got the statistics to show, which... Um, other people could follow from. They also have free tuition here. No matter no matter your income, that's what they do with the oil profits while they're phasing to clean clean energy. So having the support, I mean, it's a lot cheaper to provide daycare services for women than to lose the productivity, the creativity, the innovation, and what they add to the workforce. And essentially to the country and its economy and, and that people don't see that or maybe they do and don't care. And sometimes I wonder if maybe the reason that they have risen the cost of daycare so much or don't care to give universal care is because they know it'll force many mothers to stay home. That's, that's something to think about because <laughs> there's no incentive for them because in their mind, that's, that's, that will encourage women, you know, quote unquote, to be outside of the home and they need to be in it um, instead. So, you know, those those things, because I still have young children and, and when I struggle financially and think if I have to get a job and like what job could I get that will allow me, because I don't have family here, to pick up my children, take them, you know, pick them up because I, I don't have a grandmother, an aunt, or even a friend that can because they all have lives and kids and they're busy themselves. So that's, you know, that's something that, that really concerns me moving forward. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I thank you so much for sharing that. And um, it's definitely something to think about for sure. Um, Jane, what about you? What What's top of mind for you today? Well, a couple of things. I mean, my daughter is is uh, she's 34 and she's a new mom, new mom. The baby's 18 months old. I'm a new grandma is really what you need to know. <laughs> but, you know, she's bisexual. And when she came out as bisexual, you know, my conservative family lost their shit. And I just was like, oh, am I allowed to say that word on this? Sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> the, the more, the, the more. <laughs> but, you know, I come from a very conservative background, a very, my family immigrated from the Netherlands after World War II. And so I, I always thought I was a very conservative person. But, you know, the, the problem that I that I have as a woman who's been a Christian my whole life is the weaponization of the church against women in America. And I don't, I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how religion became a voting bloc over there. Like, it's, it is so entrenched that you know this is a country where religion freedom of religion is sacrosanct but at the same time you can have any religion you want as long as it's christian you know like it's it's a really strange thing to govern your laws and i mean even to 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 you know as as um who somebody was saying how you know they the southern baptist coalition didn't even get they literally said abortion is between a woman and her doctor you know 200 years ago, English colonies were like, well, you can have an abortion until the baby quickens, which was like 15 to 20 weeks. So this weaponization of the Bible against women and people of color, immigrants, you know, it, 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 
it's really concerning to me. I don't, I, I and you, you know, you've all seen the memes about, you know, Republican Jesus versus, you know, the real Jesus. And I, and I, I'm trying to understand how the religious right has so much power over there. <laughs> you and everybody else. Yeah. I think we're all trying to understand the same thing. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> if you you are not alone. Definitely not alone. <laughs> Maybe if this, I this brain trust can figure it out. <laughs> <It's funny>. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, my cousin came over from Michigan in the 90s, and we just died laughing when they left because she was like there with her 11 homeschooled children and her quiverful stories. And, you know, we have to have as many babies as we can, because otherwise America will not be a white Christian country by the year 2030. And I remember saying to her, honey, it was never a white Christian country. Like, you, you, what are you talking about? And not realizing that that was the foundational underpinning for what they're doing today. Like, they just... They had goals in mind and they stuck to it and we laughed at them for way too long. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. There's no other words besides wow. Um, Jess, I'd like to go to you next. Um, what's top of mind for you today? I'm, I'm sorry. A call came in and I couldn't hear your question. Oh, that's okay. Um, I'm just going around to the group before we end. And I just want to hear like, what's top of mind? What's something very personal to you um, that you just want to mention today on International Women's Day? Oh, my God. <laughs> Here's my spiel. It's, it's education. It's the attack on education, which is an attack on women. It's an attack on women and children. Um, like everybody has been saying, I live in a place where we have a child care desert. I drove 20 miles out of my way to find someone that would take my daughter. And it was just, you know, uh, somebody who was babysitting out of her home. We don't have that, you know, we have a lack of child care. We have a lack of, you know, health care. We have a lack of good roads to drive on. We have a lack of good paying jobs. And I'm in rural America. And I heard somebody talk about it earlier that they're saying, you know, make it great again. They want people to move to rural areas. And here's the thing. They don't. They're trying to flush us out. They want corporations to come in here and buy up this land and put corporate farms all over it. They want rural Americans out. They are defunding our schools. They are making sure that our teachers are making 30 grand a year so that they can get them out. They are passing voucher and charter schemes. They are passing open enrollment so people who can will take their kids, you know, from our little rural areas into other places. And I've lived rural all my life. I, I know what's happening. And it sounds crazy to say it, but they do. They want us out. And if you have any other belief than they do, they want you gone. Just like, you know, Marjorie, whoever, uh, three names, said, you know, she, she doesn't want people like us in these red states. And that's, that's the goal. That's the point. And so the point that I'm fighting back is education because everybody in my state, everybody in our country relies on education. Public schools educate 90% of the kids. What the heck are we doing? Look what they're doing in Arkansas. Look what they're doing in Iowa. And here's another thing that I want you to think of before I shut my mouth. They are rolling back child labor laws at the same time that they are defunding our schools. They want us back in the feudal system. They want us back to a system where if you can't pay to educate your kid K through 12, then too bad. You ain't going to get an education for your kid K through 12. And there, people are taking out loans to put their kids in private schools when they're in elementary school. That is a huge business in and of itself. But my point is, if we start with education, everything else sort of unravels around it. All of these issues are intertwined. Every single thing that you look and you think, what the heck is going on? Why would they do this? If you think that to yourself, one, follow the money, and two, realize that it's all interrelated. Corporations, you know, the Koch brothers, um, all these, the DeVos family, all of these people have been working this game for decades before Many of you on this call were born. They've been working this long game. So we have to recognize what we're up against, mobilize grassroots, get your folks together and do what they did during the civil rights movement. And that is direct action. You do it with your feet. You move and you make sure that they know that you know and fight back. Yes. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. I know. I'm like I love yes, that woman. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> love that woman. <laughs> We're like, oh my gosh, she just says it. And then um, 
Rachel, I'll go to you and then Ray will end with you since you're the icing on the cake. <laughs> but uh, Rachel would just love to hear like what's top of mind and what's something really personal for you um, that you're willing to share on today's International Women's Day. I'm not sure if Rachel heard. We can go to Ray. Sure. Thanks, Joe. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, sorry, I can't. I'm sorry. I, I, I was on. I was on mute. Well, go ahead, Rachel. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll go after yeah. you, Rachel. Okay. Ray, Ray should absolutely go last. And also, I'm a little intimidated going between Jess and Ray. But anyway, um, I, I'll, I do want to say you've got to read Jesus and John Wayne. I'm like the biggest. I, I actually the publisher thanked me because I talk about Jesus and John Wayne so much that um, yeah, it's kind of like. It's just, it's such a great book. Um, and it's a very readable book. So I, I highly recommend that. And, and Unholy by Sarah Posner, which is also really good. But um, it discusses a lot of these issues uh, that you just touched on as being um, a plan, a very long game um, played by very wealthy people who co-opted the church. Um, so it's funny, my husband is uh, in Canada right now and he was at a meeting last night and a major conspiracy theorist came up to him with a GoPro on to ask him questions. So I, I feel like I sound like that right now, um, buying into to like what a lot of people think are just conspiracy theories, but they're not. They're, they're, it's, it, there's a lot of truth in it. And those books are very well researched and well done. But so back to my question. Um, why what's personal to me is obviously my daughter. Um, I, I want her to be in a world where she feels she can speak up and speak the truth and it will make a difference. Because I think so many times, she's 12, she's right at that age where we know girls get more timid. We know girls change their personality sometimes to curry favor or they just feel like the outspokenness that, that they have been maybe um, in their younger years that, that they change. And there's a, a lot going on that goes into that. But um, I want her to never lose her passions and, and I want her to feel like she can make a difference. So I speak out, I do what I do so that she sees me and other women as an example that it can make a difference. And even if you don't get what you want every time, even if it doesn't work out, it doesn't mean that you sit down or sit it out to keep fighting and keep fighting. And I, I talked to her about Jess uh, Piper. I, I talked to her about other women that are not like, you know, in the spotlight, but um, stories that I like to tell her about what they do and what they're doing in their communities um, that I think is, is so important and impactful. And it's, it's difficult, but that's the work that has to be done. Um, everywhere so um yeah i mean she's she's why i do what i do i there i'm gonna butcher this quote i'm sorry i'm driving to school pickup actually but there's this uh i think it was on our podcast this week which was when i was a military spouse there was so much that i got from senior spouses when things were hard and they'd be like oh well yeah it kind of sucks but it's okay we all go through it but you know what? I want to make it better for the people who come after me. I don't want them to have to go through what I went through, um, whether that was as a military spouse or any anything else. And I don't want my daughter to have to keep fighting the same fights. I want her to be able to use her talent and her energy and her activism um, to solve bigger problems, not the same shit that we've been working on for so long. I want her to do something bigger, and that means fighting to solidify some of these rights yeah that's great thank you rachel i really appreciate that and i think those of us who are parents can completely relate to that and even if you're not a parent um just think about the future generation and do we want to keep fighting these same fights over and over um so yeah so we'll just end with you ray i would just love to hear your thoughts Thanks. And I would say many of the issues you all have talked about that are near and dear to you are near and dear to me. Um, off back, I think that what I'm most concerned about um, is the economy, um, education, 
and healthcare. Um, speaking of the economy, um, I am a I have the unfortunate pleasure of living in a red state in Jacksonville, to be exact. And while the cost of living here is um, better than some of the more metrop- metropolitan progressive areas I've lived in, um, the cost of child care is not. Um, I have a two and a half year old daughter who does go to daycare full time. And I have to think about that when I think about my own family planning. Like, will we be able to afford to have two children under five going to daycare full time? That's something I really have to wrestle with on a regular basis um, because I am of advanced maternal age and related to healthcare, um, being a black woman and being at a hospital can be a very dangerous situation. Um, I have myself um, have encountered discrimination um, at a hospital um, a few years ago when I was dealing with um, some issues with endometriosis um, after a car accident. And if it hadn't been for me advocating for myself, um, I wouldn't be here today. I would have literally gone home and died if I wouldn't have continued to ask for second and third opinions. And so um, I think very uh, thoughtfully and regularly um, about that. And then um, with regard to the economy, inflation is real. Um, Our economy has been through so many ups and downs, not only in the last year, but in the last decade. And so um, since I am a Navy spouse, I think about like how America is even positioned in the global economic system, because at any given time, there could be a conflict and my husband um, could be deployed at any time. And so very often, many of the issues I think about are about my home life, but not just my home life, but the home life of everyone. I really want our society to be better for all children, not just my own child or even a future child, um, if that happens. And so um, I am just really I'm grateful for spaces like this where we can talk about what our communities are going through and that we're doing the work to fight back against extremism and these repressive policies. And so um, it's been an honor and pleasure being with you all this International Women's Day. And, uh, oh, we only got one day. We've got to celebrate women um, 365, 24-7, as I like to say. And so um, that's what's been on my mind. And thank you all for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, Ray. Thank you, Rachel, Jess, Heather, Ty, Jane, and Joe. Um, Wow, what an amazing group of women, and I feel truly honored to be part of this. Amen. Um, So thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, And I'm Jill from Red Wine and Blue, and check us out at redwine.blue. Check out our website. We have all kinds of resources and trainings. Um, We have a phenomenal podcast called The Suburban Women Problem, which Rachel Venman is one of the hosts of. So I highly recommend listening to that. Um, And then Joe and I do lots of conversations like this on Twitter and Instagram as well. Um, So we'll just keep the conversation going. So thank you for joining. Have a great day. And we'll talk to you later. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.